shelter from any typhoons. Mm -hmm. The water is fertile, it's clean, mm -hmm. and there is no potential for pollution. Okay. East Coast of Sabah is one of the best places for the wild uh, Pintada Maxima to grow. Mm -hmm. The Sorry, population what did you say? is. What was that? Pintada Maxima. Pintada Maxima. It's the, it's the species type of the pearl, pearl oyster. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, so we're harvesting the oysters now. Yes. And I have a very good feeling. Very good feeling that these are going to be the mother of pearls. Yep. Yeah. Which one do we start? You teach me first. This one is already slightly open. You just hold it uh -huh. and then just cut it. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, look at it. Look at that pearl. It's a gold pearl. The golden South Sea pearls is the highest value pearls in the world at the moment. That's beautiful. So how much would... One of these go for the market. Maybe a few hundred. All right, thank you very much for doing business. <clears throat> I'll uh, wear those on my uh, birthday. Thank you. You can hold as many as you can, but you cannot fit it. Oh my lord, this is like gold. Beautiful. Treasures of Saba. Isn't that beautiful? I soon discovered, though, that bringing these treasures to life is no walk in the park. This is probably the first process uh, of the pearl culture. This is to select a pair or two pairs of male and female mature oyster to get them spawning. The female oyster, the gonad, will be yellowish color. Okay, and the male? For the male, we have, uh, it's sperm, mm -hmm. so it's creamy white. So what you're saying is that you're principally matchmaking oysters. Correct. So those are the virile ones. Yes. That's the, mm, bounce, chicka, bounce. So it's like the, the In this clinic, though, the creative process requires the oysters to endure some serious surgery. One mental piece is going to do a surgical operation. We must insert one mental piece together with a nucleus into the body of the oyster. I can do this. I can do this. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna go in. I have razor sharp eyes. I can see it, yes? Oh, I'm really sorry. That's gotta hurt. That's gotta hurt. It was a very intense surgery. It was a difficult procedure. But I believe that this oyster has made it. It's all good. With surgery over, the oysters move on to their intensive care unit. The clean condition and mineral content of these waters provide the ideal place for a speedy recovery. Down below me are the South Sea Pearls of Saba. They are voted as one of the most expensive in the world. Booyah! Okay, Denise, please go down to check the condition of the oyster. Yes, Lao Pan. Okay, here we go. So how is it? They look all right. Yeah. They look, look like they're in good condition. What do we have here? More oysters! Yes, uh, this is a one year old oyster. Okay. And every month we have to pull them up to clean them, to remove all the uh, foul organisms stuck on the oyster. So, Denise, you can start by cleaning this. Like this? Yes. How long do you think you put her to work here? Uh, roughly a month to get the pearl. One month I have to be here to yes. get one necklace. One pearl. One pearl? Yes. <laughs> Come back to work. Tell me to work. I don't need to work. This is so much better than work. Coming up, I plunge into deeper waters of Saba's East Coast to meet the most amazing living treasure I've ever seen. We're officially nuts. I've never seen anything like that before. The coastline of Southeast Saba is populated mainly by the Sulu and Bajau, cultures inseparable from the sea. 
This is Bombom Island. It's one of the many islands off Samporna. There are many Bajau communities off the coast, and despite them being on land, they still want to be on water. How cool is that? Every April, the coastal Bajau celebrate their seafaring heritage with a colorful maritime festival filled with decorative boats called the Lepa. My Boat Making 101 class is conducted by Haji Alpaka, a legendary craftsman who runs workshops for the families in his community. I think he assigned me the easiest job so that I wouldn't screw up any of his beautiful Lepa boats. Sandpaper and wood. These miniature Lepa, sold as souvenirs, can be done within a day. But the full-size boats take three months to complete. It's an involved process they take great pride in because these are the ultimate symbols of Bajau culture. Sebab dulu-dulu, dia ada pakai kereta, dia ada pakai kapal, dia pakai layar pakai ini. Sebab dulu-dulu, dia banyak tinggal di pulau-pulauan ini. Sebagai satu transport, tinggi satu pulau, satu pulau. Di mana-mana daerah, kalau orang Bajau nampak begini, memang dia ingat. What are the Bajal most proud of? Making the lepa boat or seeing the lepa boat go at sea? Masa bikin sama masa yang siap, mungkin bangga lagi kalau sudah siap. Riang hati kalau sudah siap sebab sudah boleh dipakai. The Bajal close to Sampurna have settled into their landed lives here for generations. But a little further out near islands like Mabul, you'll find other types of Bajau only just getting used to having a fixed sense of location. The Bajau Laut, or sea gypsies here, are transitory communities who still lead nomadic lives out at sea. Helping me explore this fascinating way of life is actually someone raised in a landlocked culture, but who's now grown more and more in love with the sea. Now, I've had some pretty amazing dive experiences so far, but what you didn't know is that my real dive buddy is my cameraman who is out there, and I'd like to introduce him to you. How are you doing, Chris? I'm all right, how are you? Good, man, it's a wonderful day. Welcome, <laughs> welcome to my office. This is where you work, huh? Hey. Good to see you again. Hey. Hey. How are you? <laughs> you good? Yeah, yeah, all right. So what have you shot today? A lot. You're going to see that tomorrow. Yeah? Yeah. Chris Tun is the guy responsible for all the underwater scenes on this show. He spends weeks on end out here shooting beneath the surface every day around the islands. This is not just your office. This is pretty much your home. I just love this place. Spend a lot of time walking around here just to see people and just to get to know them. So you know pretty much everyone here. Yeah, yeah, pretty much everyone. Yeah. Boss, okay, ka? Jalan -jalan lo, ha? How did you end up in the water? Because you're Kadasan, you're supposed to be a land person. I still remember when I was 10 years old, I was watching a documentary about sharks. And this one scene, the cameraman was pointing up the camera, silhouette shot of the hammerhead. And then from that moment, I was like, right, I want to be that cameraman. This is what I really want to be, actually, when, since I was 10. Mm -hmm. And now I'm really doing it. So um, I'm really happy what I'm doing right now. I think I'm living my dream. Chris has promised to set me up with what he swears will be the most unforgettable aquatic experience I'll ever have. I'm going to introduce you to my, my best friend, actually. His name is Armstrong. This is Armstrong. Hey, Armstrong. How are you, man? Armstrong is a local dive master who seems to be best friends with everyone around here. And one of them happens to be the ultimate dive master of these parts. This is my best friend, Sir Jorben. Hi. Do you like diving? I love to dive. Can you take some diving with the Jorben's free dive? Jorben, you go. Yeah. This is the Jorben Goga. So when you go down, no need the scuba. You just go down, by the feet. no need the fin, no need everything. I'd like to introduce my dive buddy for the day. There is nobody else that knows these waters better than he does. And we're going to check out some corals and maybe do some spear fishing. Isn't that right? Uh. 
Okay, so unlike my new dive buddy, I'm not exactly coming from the minimalist school. Still, Armstrong insists that for this dive, I need my air tank filled to the max. As we drop down beyond 20 meters, I begin to understand why. Joblin is in a different league altogether. Unbelievable. These new fins cost me an arm and a leg, but I just can't keep up with this guy. He just glides effortlessly on the seabed, taking his sweet time like, just going down out to pick some lunch, honey. Shouldn't be too long. This is mind-blowing. You're mad. You're officially nuts. I've never seen anything like that before. How does he control it? On the bottom, uh -huh. he can control the breathing, how to long. Inside his lungs, yeah, he can control. Yeah, inside the lungs, yeah. And that's how he walks on the corals. So this one is easy for him. He's half fish, half man. Oh, high five, man. Left, um, <laughs> Now you gotta teach me how to spearfish, okay? Wally? Now it's my turn. With some bare coaching, just like Joblin's style, he sets me free to hunt on my own. What an amazing experience of a life aquatic. It makes me want to take this ride further out to really explore what it's like to live completely at one with the sea. One of the few things the Baja Laut associate with land is the idea of death. Many of the little islands they come across serve only as burial sites. Everything else, their entire way of life, takes place on water. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. <laughs> Roaming these seas for the best dive spots, Armstrong has come to know lots of nomadic families. This one we call in on are preparing to travel to a wedding ceremony several days away out at sea. The Bajos, you don't know about the, in the mainland. You don't know about the car, the playing in the mainland, you don't know. The Bajau go to Shepona just buy food. And, and water. Water and everything. I can't imagine living yeah. out on a boat and not having a sense of time, yeah. calendar, yeah. not having a sense of land, and not knowing what else is out there. But the one thing that I've learned here on this boat with the Baja Lads is that they're completely and utterly warm, friendly, and they always welcome you on their boat. She has a beautiful voice. In Sipadan, there's just too much to see. If you blink, you lose the moment. After exploring the sea cultures of Sabah, my maritime odyssey through Malaysia's islands is coming to a close. But before we wrap up, my underwater cameraman Chris says he saved the best diving experience for last. Today, we're finally heading out to the legendary island of Sipadan. I really thought Sipadan was much larger than this. As far as diving destinations go, the tiny island of Sipadan is Malaysia's jewel in the crown. Today, it's heavily protected and careful limitations are imposed on the number of visitors, so you need to apply well in advance for a diving permit. You've been raving about Sipadan, now we're finally here. What is it about? I've been diving a lot of places, but Sipadan always amazed me. My favorite dive point is Barracuda Point. I had one dive day and I saw everything. Now you have one of the best jobs in the world at the 
best dive spots in the world. Yeah. I want to be you. To use the camera is not that hard actually. So what you need to do is just press the record button and just film them. You're making it sound easy. <laughs> it does not look that easy. I see you swim underwater so fast, so quick. I just don't want you to get stressed out when you dive. I want you to enjoy the dive and at the same time when you um, hold the camera you can record what you see as well. This is how we do it in Sipadel. I'm ready. Let's right, go. Let's go. Ah. Count to three, yeah? That's on. One, two, three, go. Sipadan's small atoll-like surface sits on a long, seemingly endless column formed by living corals growing on top of an extinct volcanic cone. It's at the heart of one of the richest marine habitats in the world, with over 3,000 species of fish and hundreds of different types of coral. Sipadan is consistently rated one of the top dive destinations in the world. So it's just at the edge of the wall, actually, which is uh, drop vertically to 600 meters. And it's so easy for you to see turtles swimming just around this wall, actually. Oop, there goes a the turtle. It's one day, yeah? <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. That's just amazing. This is the jackfish or the big eye traveler. We were quite lucky actually when we jumped down and the jacks were right under there. I was completely and utterly overwhelmed by yeah. the amount of fish. We had done so many dives before and we were chasing and looking yeah, for yeah, fish yeah. and you know trying to find something. Yeah. But in Sipadan, there's just too much to see. Yeah. You're constantly turning 360 yeah. degrees, like looking at this, looking at that, we're all over the place. If you blink, you lose the moment. Now that I'm finally here, it almost feels like every dive I've done before has been a practice, a build-up, preparing me for the incredible experience of trying to capture this moment. Underwater filming is all about steady shot, slow movement. You get a bit disoriented when you're yeah. looking through the camera because you're floating. The only thing that you have is this small little lens and you're seeing just that amount. And then when you look around, you've basically floated away. You have to be good with your buoyancy so that when you hover and you can keep your camera very, very steady. As we follow the wall further down, I soon discover it's not just the camera, but also my nerves that I need to keep steady. Just when you signaled shark, that's when my heart went pitta patta, pitta patta, pitta patta. And, and I realized my camera wasn't on. How do you approach the shark that close? All the sharks are hunting. Yeah, we were lucky actually, because it's not often you see the shark having this hunting behavior. So when you see them hunting, you just pick one spot and then just keep your camera steady and just press the record button. You see there, right there? There are all these sharks just circling. That's when I thought, I'm in a good situation. Now's the time to film them. Dun, 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 dun. <gasps> did you get freaked out? I did. With the first shark, I was so scared. And then afterwards, when there were so many, I realized I need to just take it all in. That's yeah. when I dropped the camera. I, I didn't want to film it anymore. I just wanted to be in the moment. Yeah. As we dropped down deeper, there were several passages and caverns that were yeah. very dark and mysterious yeah. and almost eerie. This cavern here, the turtle tomb, mm. there's a lot of turtles just go in there and then they just got lost and then they just died. That's why they have a big sign there saying, um, yeah, do not enter. Inside the tomb, there's a lot of like tunnels and chambers mm. and you can see a lot of skeletons, the turtles. I've been to the tomb like a couple of times, but every time I go there, just get me, get me this feeling like, oh, it's so creepy. That's a death zone, so it's yeah. probably not a good idea to go in there. No, it's not a good idea. Noted. Wow. That's a nice shot. 
What do you think of my footage? It's decent. Is it usable? I think you have like four or five seconds clip, which is very steady. And it's good. I'm just going to pat myself on my shoulders there. Good job, Denise. Every time I complete a passage, I always look forward to the next one. But on this one, for the first time, I see the real art in looking back. One, two, three, four. Trying to capture such incredible moments that reveal themselves only if you look below the surface. It was the biggest wreck I've ever seen. There's a deep sense of reward that's just beyond words. One that takes your breath away. <gasps> oh my gosh, look at it! From the gorgeous sanctuaries of the peninsula to the seaborne cultures of Sabah, this passage to the islands of Malaysia surprised me with just how incredibly diverse life can be, both below and above the surface. I met such interesting people, each with different but innate bonds with the sea. And I'm coming back to these islands because they can free you, recharge you, and open new horizons.